So our readings today are about healing, Job and Bartimaeus. And I was thinking as reflecting on these readings that traditional medicine has been with us for many, many generations. Many of our modern day drugs and treatments come from plants and concoctions that have been known to humanity uh, for thousands of years. And about 20 years ago, I was doing AIDS work in Uganda. And one of the things that they did was they brought together traditional healers. And these are kind of witch doctor people. And about 80% of Ugandans, before they would make any major decision in life, they would go and get counsel from a traditional healer. So the chair of the Ugandan AIDS Commission thought it was a really good idea to involve them in the process of AIDS prevention and care. And brought them in, taught them a little biology, a little physiology. And they were an amazing group of people on the forefront of AIDS prevention. And they would use their herbs and their medicines and they would use their treatment. They often were in the front line of detecting the early signs of HIV in the country. So it was very smart to involve traditional medicine um, for uh, how to handle this uh, human crisis. And there was a study, I remember in the mid-90s, World Health, World Health Organization did a blind study of Western medicine and traditional medicine using the drugs that they knew and the treatments that they knew. And traditional medicine in Uganda was providing as much support and healing around the symptoms of HIV as Western medicine was doing back then. In my first parish in Ireland uh, 40 years ago, I had this you know, perfect situation. We had the big parish church, and then up the hill, up the mountain, was this little country area. And I had my own little church that I could kind of, you know, be a young curate in. And one of the characters, and there were this, the parish was full of characters, one of the characters was a guy called Billy. And I would go visit Billy, and he told me, he said, I know this friend of mine in Ballymena, who has a cure, a charm for shingles. And apparently this charm had been passed to him from his grandfather to his father to him. And so this was, you know, this was a, a world. We used to joke about Balamina, that it was, you know, you put your clock back 400 years when you went to this very remote part of Ireland. And the joke was, uh, what, what did people in Balamina do about sex? We had were tea about sex in Balamina. So um, lo and behold, my mother contracted shingles. And you know, 40 years ago, there wasn't a lot that could be done in terms of managing those very difficult, painful symptoms of shingles, right? And so I told her, I said, I know this guy who knows somebody in Balamina who has a charm. And she says, you know, I'm in agony. I'll try anything. So we arranged the appointment, and off we went. And we met this lovely man with white hair. He was in his mid-60s. And he brought us in, and he sat us down. And he would talk to my mother. And then he'd go into this little room, and he'd lay hands on her and pray. And then he'd come out, and he'd talk to me, and he'd talk to her, and then he'd take her back into the room and lay hands on her, and he would recite the Lord's Prayer. And then, and he did that three times. And we were told not to offer him money, but that we would leave, quietly leave a gift in Thanksgiving. And we did that. And I remember my mother was, uh, her, the pain was so awful that she couldn't turn her head. And as we drove out of his driveway, she was able to see if the road was clear going out, and she was healed. Now, my, my father and my brothers remain totally skeptical about all this. <laughs> totally skeptical. But traditional medicine worked. 
And you know, I, and that you know, I was intrigued by that experience as a young priest. And then along came the epidemic of AIDS, and we didn't have medicine. We didn't. We weren't able to cure this or to fix this stigma. And the only thing that we could do, and I, I, I helped to set up this um, All Saints Aid Service Center in Pasadena, which served about an eighth of Los Angeles County. And as a priest, we were called to the ministry of healing. That was our work. And we would use oil that was uh, consecrated by the bishop. We would anoint people with oil and lay hands on them. And we didn't heal AIDS, but that we healed the stigma and the isolation that was often associated with AIDS. And that had a profound impact on me as a person. And so when I hear these stories, I go back to my own experience. I go back to the man in Balamina. And I go back to people that I knew through the AIDS Service Center. And that I see people like Job and Bartimaeus as real people. And I believe that Jesus actually healed Bartimaeus. I believe there are people in our world who have the gift of healing in that way. And I've seen it in my own, in my own experience. It's very easy. It's very easy <clears throat> when we lose our health or when things don't go well for us to give up on God. You know, we see God as a kind of Santa Claus in the sky, right? And if we don't get what we want, we just stop believing in God. And a lot of people do that. You know, my grandfather, I think I've told the story, he as a teenager, was on the salvage crew that picked up the remains of the Titanic. And he became an atheist because he could not believe that a God above would allow such a disaster to happen. And he remained an atheist most all of his life. And the kind of Santa Claus God didn't work for him. You know, so I'm just going to give up. But it's, it's interesting, if we're looking at the character of Job, um, that Job doesn't give up. That Job deals with his affliction and his, um, his disease. And I mean, the, the story of Job is a very powerful story because it's about, it asks the deeper questions, why does God allow this to happen to, to good people? Job didn't do anything wrong. He was a man of great integrity. And he just hung in there with God, fighting with God. Why am I going through this? And how do I make the best of this? I want to tell another story about um, somebody who reminds me of Job. Um, as an executive director of a, a large healthcare agency, it's very easy to get detached from your clients and your mission, because you've got meetings and administration and grant writing and all sorts of things to keep the machinery going that moves you forward. One of the things I did was once a month, I would have lunch or spend time with certain clients from the AIDS service center to keep me grounded, just to make sure that what we were doing actually worked or if things needed to change, that I would listen uh, to our client community to find out what it is that we needed to, you know, to adjust. And one of the friends that I had was a, a man, young man, 32 years old. His name was Dennis. Dennis lived in Pasadena. Um, he had a background in marketing, a very successful career. And he found himself with this very frightening disease. And he lost... Um, a lot of his health, and the disease way back then <clears throat> also meant for some people you lost your sight. And Dennis went blind. And I remember <clears throat> we would go out to lunch, and one day he said, I want to go to the Huntington Library and Gardens 
which is a beautiful private estate in Pasadena. And we were walking arm in arm, he's blind, walking down this beautiful trellis of wisteria that's in full bloom. And we're walking down and he said, Albert, and he stops, he said, over there is a tree. Yes. That's where I used to do my homework as a teenager. And we would continue walking. And he said, I can't see the wisteria, but I can taste it at the back of my tongue. And it was amazing that somebody who was blind had this amazing sensibility, different senses that were heightened that those of us who see do not have. And, <clears throat> you know, De Dennis could have been like Job and cursed God and died. Dennis probably wrestled with those inner conversations about, like the friends of Job, you've done something wrong, right? So repent and God will fix it but he didn't. But what Dennis did was he started a program that helped people with AIDS who were going to lose their sight be able to stay in their homes as people who were going to be blind. And it was a program that uh, trained people. Uh, they taught Braille. They taught them how to design their homes so that they could move around. Imagine if you knew you were going to be blind and you wanted to stay home what you'd have to do. And Dennis threw himself into that work. And there was a kind of transformative suffering, redemptive suffering that Dennis lived out. And it was an extraordinary honor um, to journey with him, literally, through that valley of the shadow. I, I want to talk about Bartimaeus because um, the story of Bartimaeus is very powerful. Jesus is, in a week's time, Jesus is going to be dead. So he's in Jericho, 20 miles away is Jerusalem. And this is kind of the last kind of miracle. It's the last action. And in Mark's gospel, <clears throat> two chapters before, The disciples of Jesus come to him, and Jesus says to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said, well, when we get to Jerusalem and you're made the king, I want to be your um, secretary of state and your minister of the treasury. I want to sit on your right hand and your left hand. And Jesus kind of goes, oh, these turkeys, what am I going to do? I've spent three years with these people, and they still do not get it. And he's a week away from being crucified. And it's very interesting, because it's my belief that Bartimaeus was, Jesus needed Bartimaeus to give him the strength to move into Jerusalem. That in the most unlikely person, a beggar, a homeless person, who literally throws off his cloak, throws off his identity and steps forward. Son of David, have mercy on me. And that Jesus is so impressed by that faith, that energy, that commitment, and that he follows Jesus to Jerusalem. Um, you know, I think in, in life, there are people like Bartimaeus and Dennis that come to us and that we think we're helping them, but they're actually helping and shaping and helping us to find God. Even people that appear rejected by God or that God is not blessing. Um, God is not. And, and I, think, I think that there's a, a kind of sense in which, um, I mean, I, I can remember if it happened this week, having lunch with Dennis. I can remember that story and what he taught me. Um, John and I were talking about the Job reading um, just before 
the ser service today. And <clears throat> it looks on the surface that, um, that God is, that kind of he repents and that God then blesses him with all these camels and donkeys and children and so on. But actually, if you read the text, um, there's a very different uh, interpretation of the Job story. Some of you know this book. It's called God, a Biography by uh, Jack Miles. It's here in our library. Bless you. Um, it's here in our library. And <clears throat> what Miles does is he, he treats the subject of the personality of God like literature. So he's not about inducing faith or belief. He's just saying, this is how God is presented in the First Testament in all its complexity, right? And Miles is very interested in the, uh, in the Job story. But what, what he concludes is that actually this, why is God playing with this man? Why is God allowing this suffering to happen to this man? And that in fact, Job becomes the courageous, the outstanding human being that actually changes God. And that we were talking earlier, that if you want to think about it, that God is embarrassed by Job's faithfulness and he rewards him as a result of Job's faithfulness not to give in. So this is the translation that um, Jack Miles gives. And I'm going to try and do it in, in the way that um, it, it honors the text. Then, <clears throat> then Job answered the Lord, you know you can do anything. Nothing can stop you. You ask, who is this ignorant muddler? Well, I said, more than I knew. Wonders quite beyond me. You listen, I talk, you say. I'll question you, and you tell me. Word of you had reached my ears, but now that my eyes have seen you, I shudder with sorrow for mortal clay. What he's implying is that this, the struggling of God, that actually Job converts God to be more just, to be more charitable. And I think that's something we need to think about. It's actually in Job's faithfulness not to curse God and die, but that, that Job becomes the ultimate example of humanity matured, a way that he is grace-filled, and that God finally uh, blesses him out of embarrassment. You know, so often... When we are talking about, there are two things that we do together as a community of faith that take us back to the early, early church. And this has not changed in 2,000 years. We heal people and we eat with the people that we heal. And there are the, the texts in the Gospels, there are first through third century uh, paintings and frescoes of the Christian community, that is the thing that we have had in common since the beginning. And how we translate that into our modern day work is something that we are uh, exploring. Today, we're going to be um, hearing from Dutchess County Community Action Agency. We're delighted that their executive director, uh, Liz Spira, is with, is with us. And we are partners with you. The largest contribution in the healing work of this community from St. Peter's goes to your work. So we're very honored um, to have you with us. And we're looking forward to hearing how, as we journey together, how we bring healing and transformation and celebration to God's world.